Everybody, welcome back to the fourth and final night. Uh, thank you for staying with us for this uh, whole time. I know you all have many other things, ways you could be spending your your evenings, your mornings, or your late, late, late nights for those of you from Africa and Europe. Today we've got uh, some terrific uh, guests with us. Uh, the first session, we're going to hear from the arms. We're going to do a virtual tour of the Arms Control Association. On the second session, we're going to hear from a number of uh, young professionals about uh, what they're what it's like to work in this field, uh, and a little bit about how they got here and you know how they see working in this field. Um, so let let me start with the the first session with the Arms Control Association. This is one of the first organizations that I got to know when I got to Washington in 1987. I was working for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and, and working on arms control and nuclear issues for the bishops. And this was one of our partner organizations. It's not a large organization. It's relatively small, a think tank, an advocacy organization, but it uh, punches way above its weight. Um, and if in one way you know that is to look at what the former staff of the Arms Control Association uh, have been doing. One of the final three candidates for Secretary of Defense was someone uh, who came to the Arms Control Association when I was there in the late 80s. Uh, in, in academic, in key academic positions, key government positions, uh, working on arms control and nuclear questions. Um, you'll find a lot of former uh, staff of the Arms Control Association because they they do such great work and they really develop, um, they're really good at developing the next generation. And so with us today, uh, we're really fortunate to have uh, two people, both of whom are University of Notre Dame graduates, both uh, Shannon Bugos, who Bugos, who you're gonna uh, is gonna introduce herself more uh, in the uh, second session, uh, and Kelsey Davenport. Uh, Kelsey Davenport was uh, one of the best students, maybe the best student. I I'll say one of the best students because another of my students, Monica Montgomery, is on the second panel. But Kelsey Davenport uh, was a terrific student. Uh, she had been in Washington before, working on Capitol Hill, and she did a master's at in peace studies at the Clark Institute, and then she went back to Washington to work for the Arms Control Association, where she is one of the the uh, rising, rising or risen stars on arms control issues. And so we're really fortunate to have Kelsey and Shannon with us uh, for this session. So take it away, Kelsey. Great. Well, thank you, Jerry, for that very kind introduction of Shannon and I and the Arms Control Association. It's really great to be with all of you today. So thank you so much for inviting me. I had the pleasure to do this in person uh, a few years ago, the last time this course was, was in DC. So I'm, I'm glad to have a chance to join you virtually. I know it's not the same, but um, it's great then that we're able to incorporate people from so many different parts of the country. So I am going to now try to share my screen because Shannon and I have put together a little PowerPoint to kind of guide uh, everyone through our, our presentation. Um, I'm going to warn you, I am working with a new computer here because we had a, uh, an unfortunate North Korean hack this week. So we'll see if I actually manage to uh, share this correctly. Um, one thing that uh, you know, we often get is that working on nuclear weapons, we should be you know, up on the most advanced technology, but you have to remind people that nuclear weapons are technology from the 40s. So uh, um, let's see. Great, can everybody see that? Or are you all seeing the presenter view? Uh, seeing presenter view. Okay. Yeah. okay, let me see if I can. There, is that better? That's better. Oops, let's see. Oh, sorry. There. Uh, so I figured since you can't uh, actually uh, come to the Arms Control Association, you should at least see who we are. So this was our holiday card from this year. Um, so there's, we're a staff of uh, about 15. 
And we're an organization that was founded in 1971. And as you'll see here, um, this uh, statement that appears on our website is actually part of the original mission statement that you know, we're a nonpartisan membership organization dedicated to promoting understanding and support for effective arms control policies. Uh, and what I'm really gonna talk about today is how we at the Arms Control Association try to influence policy and public understanding of nuclear weapons, and then talk a little bit about the key policy areas of our research for, for 2021. So first, in terms of kind of situating the Arms Control Association within sort of the Washington DC policy community, um, we fit into the space that some people call sort of an action tank. So there are elements of our work that are much more like a traditional think tank where we do some of the longer research and analytical reports, you know, with policy prescriptions that look at sort of strat strategy for US policy and arms control and nonproliferation in the long term. Uh, but we also do a lot of sort of much more immediately policy responsive work uh, we do some work in kind of the direct action space, either working directly with grassroots organizations uh, or through our own action uh, work. And then, um, and, and so in that area, we kind of kind of bridge that gap between kind of the traditional think tank world uh, and sort of the more traditional sort of grassroots space. Uh, so when we look at sort of the audiences of our work, I'd say there are three that really jump out as, as primary. You know, first is I think most people would expect uh, for any group in DC, they're sort of the policy makers. Uh, and this is the group that we focus on when we're really trying to, you know, to change a policy, to advance sort of a new policy. And we do this primarily to, through sort of three, three tools. You know, first, education, as you'll see, is, is a core part of our work kind of across all of our different audiences. But if you think about, you know, policymakers, particularly in the United States, the range of issues that they have to deal with, uh, there's not a lot of depth of knowledge on, on particular um, nuanced technical issues. So a lot of what we do to lay the groundwork for trying to influence policy is, is bringing people sort of up to speed on some of the, the technical nuances in the nuclear policy space. And, you know, and that includes things like, you know, what's the status of North Korea's nuclear and missile programs? You know, what do we think, you know, Russia is saying? How are we interpreting Russian remarks about extending the New START Treaty? Sort of all of that falls into that education space. And then related to that, you know, the policymakers are also a key audience, you know, when we are trying to advance certain policy analysis or certain policy recommendations. And you know, we're in a really interesting moment right now with a presidential transition where there's a really wide space to actually try to influence policy. So I'm gonna be talking more about our, our own policies sort of more specifically. But you know, in that space, you know, a lot of that includes congressional briefings. So you know, down here in the bottom corner, um, this is a briefing we did on, on Capitol Hill uh, last year on North Korea um, with, uh, with former Senator Richard Lugar but before he passed away. Uh, and sometimes this in, involves actually going to the seat of where decisions are being made on, on nuclear policy. So we participated on the, sort of the outskirts of uh, most of the rounds of, of the nuclear talks between uh, the P5 plus one and, and Iran leading up to the deal in, in 2015. So this is actually a, a picture sort of I took um, while, while I was uh, you know, on the outskirts of, 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 of those talks. So we really try to get kind of on the ground, engaging with policymakers to share our ideas, to understand their concerns, you know, and where necessary to try to give them the information that we think is necessary to really make informed decisions. And then the second area of our work uh, really focuses on the, the general public. I mean, we strongly believe that, you know, empowering people, you know, not only in the United States, but around the world to understand the threat posed by nuclear weapons and to help guide them in terms of understanding the steps that they can take to actually ad advance disarmament is a really critical part of, of, of our mission and really critical to influencing that first group of policymakers. I mean, policymakers need to hear you know, not only from us, you know, the experts, uh, but also to understand that these are, that nuclear weapons and nuclear threats are, are of concern to their communities and that their communities expect them to, to take action on, on these issues. Uh, so some of what we do in this space, again, is just, you know, education. I mean, speaking to groups like this, you know, my colleague Kingston and I, you know, we also speak to a lot of university students. Uh, we speak to a lot of, you know, foreign affairs councils kind of across the country. Uh, and, and speaking to, to groups that, um, you know, that, that may kind of touch on nuclear weapons, you know, as, as part of, you know, podcast series I've included here, you know, Shannon was on a podcast recently talking about New Start, that, that was fantastic. 
uh, and, and really looking for those avenues to just ensure that people actually understand the risk posed by nuclear weapons and that they have a factual basis for, for that knowledge and that they have ideas on how they can actually act to, to, to sort of advance the, the goals of, of non-proliferation and disarmament. And then some of our work there relatedly also goes to supporting um, more grassroots focused groups. Uh, we work in coalition with a lot of organizations that have you know, networks across the country. Um, this photo down here actually is from some work that we did uh, with a number of groups that were supporting the arms trade treaty. Uh, this is an arms trade treaty protest you know, outside the White House. I'm uh, one of those people lying there on the ground. Um, and we have found this to be a really effective way to also kind of further amplify you know, our voices, but also to help us better understand what people around the country think about nuclear weapons. Uh, so we can kind of see where some of those gaps and understanding are that, that are so critical. And then another, uh, so I would say sort of the third avenue of focus for our work is, is the media. And again, part of this is, again, is an education mission. I mean, given, you know, sort of that, that media kind of covering the Hill, covering, you know, the White House, covering the State Department may tangentially run into nuclear weapons issues, but they're not likely to be really seated uh, in, in, in understanding the nuances of these topics. So we do a lot of outreach to reporters, whether that's through briefings, you know, press releases, or even just one-on-one -on -one phone calls to try to ensure that issues uh, or that, that pieces you know, that touch on nuclear weapons are, are reporting accurately. And then of course, you know, we're often asked to provide commentary too. Um, so you can see here, you know, this is a, a picture of me on Fox News talking about the Iran deal and then below a clip from my, my colleague who was interviewed for the Wall Street Journal. And I included this TV clip in particular in case uh, any of you are taking classes with Jerry Powers and he makes you do a TV interview so that you can see that it actually does you know, come back to help you in your career as awkward as it feels in the moment. Um, so this is sort of the, our three kind of general audiences um, that I just wanted to touch on and, and talking about how we work. Um, so to look at then how we kind of communicate to these audiences, you know, one thing that's becoming you know, increasingly apparent with the rise of, of social media, the different way people consume news is that you know, we've had to kind of branch out to ensure that we're reaching uh, audiences you know, in the manner in which they consume information. Um, so some of our, you know, some of the products that we produce, you know, are, have, you know, have, have been around for, for decades and some of those are still very effective. So we put out a monthly publication called Arms Control Today. And if we're talking about audiences for this publication, you know, some of that is the policymakers, you know, we include feature pieces that um, some of whom uh, authors, you know, you might recommend here, David and George have written for us, Jerry, you know, this is one of our, our first issues. Um, from the 1970s. Uh, and that's just a way to you know, promote the ideas of other scholars and experts in the fields. Uh, but there's also a reporting component here too. So Shannon and I write for this you know, every month, you know, pro providing updates on just a range of, of, of nuclear policy issues. Um, so that's one of our critical tools of, of communications. And then you'll see here, I've just put in another, a, a list of sort of all of the different ways that we try to communicate at, at, at the Arms Control Association. Uh, in part, because they said, if you think about, you know, these different audiences that I identified in that first slide, you know, the policymakers, the general public and the media, you realize that it's really critical when you're crafting a policy to sure, ensure that it's disseminated, you know, in, in the right way. I mean, you can write, you know, the greatest policy recommendations in the world, but, you know, they're not going to be acted on if, if you don't really think critically about that communications, sort of an outreach piece. Um, so just to go through, you know, a few of these, you know, one thing that's really important in our education mission is just providing, you know, solid factual information that, you know, informs people, you know, when they're writing or researching on this topic. So this graphic here, you know, estimated nuclear warhead inventories. I mean, this is one of our most heavily trafficked pages on our website. It just explains, you know, what countries actually have nuclear weapons and, and, and how many they have. And these are just meant to be objective, you know, resources that we try to keep up to, as up to date as possible. Uh, then, you know, we have uh, sort of a, a category in, of communications products here, you know, our reports, our issue briefs, our policy papers, uh, and these are really designed, you know, more at that policy making community. Uh, these are, uh, these are written with more expert audience in mind, and again, with those very specific, um, you know, with, with, uh, with, with those very kind of specific, you know, policy recommendations that we would like to see uh, policymakers sort of take forward. 
Um, now, anytime, you know, you're writing for that policymaker crowd, you know, you want to have that more sort of in-depth piece of research, you know, either your report or, or your longer issue brief or, or white paper. Um, but you usually want to then accompany by that with a, you know, a shorter policy memo. Uh, because, you know, oftentimes, you know, for a, a busy member of Congress, you know, a busy policymaker, you know, they may only initially have time to read two pages. Uh, so you have to be able to take kind of those larger ideas, you know, and distill them down into that quickly digestible material, and then, you know, provide, you know, the longer policy paper or the issue brief when they want to come back, sort of learn more and, and, and build on that, 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 that idea. Um, then, you know, rapid response is another part of our, uh, of our, our work, both for, you know, influencing or informing the general public, and then also informing the media. So, you know, we put out, um, you know, blogs when we need to respond to something quickly. Um, just for example, you know, down here, this is a place where we can be, you know, a little bit more uh, edgy in, in our writing. Um, this is something I wrote after tear gas was used against, you know, peaceful protesters in front of the White House in June. And then, you know, Twitter increasingly is an area that is an avenue that we use to interact with, um, you know, with reporters to try to get our commentary out there, you know, to inform the general public, but then also to take in news about, about nuclear weapons issues. You know, one thing is, as much as I think, you know, social media can be a double-edged sword is that it gives us a lot more insight into how people are talking about issues surrounding nuclear policy in, in different parts of the world uh, because it does increase, increase accessibility. Uh, and then of course, you know, some of our communications are done through the very typical, you know, briefings, whether that's one-on-one -on -one meetings with policymakers, you know, briefings for the press, uh, and then we also, of course, work in, in coalition with, with other organizations, as, as I mentioned before. And that's just to, you know, to increase kind of the reach of our work, um, to learn and, and gain you know, information from what other organizations are doing. Um, but also to understand that when you think about you know, how nuclear weapons and nuclear threats affect people, uh, they do so in very different ways. Uh, so, you know, having, you know, the grassroots understanding, you know, working with grassroots organizations to understand how local communities feel impacted, you know, helps our work, uh, just as their work is, is assisted by understanding how we view the policy landscape in, in, in Washington. Um, so again, you know, like I said, thinking about, not only about, you know, who you're communicating to, but how you're providing them the information you know, is the really critical part of being effective in the policy space in, in, in DC. Um, so moving on then, um, before I get into our policy priorities, I just wanna talk a little bit about sort of where we are today and kind of this, this moment. Um, you know, one thing that I think is an unfortunate kind of mindset now that Biden has been elected and is going to take office next week is this idea that the United States can simply return to where we were, you know, four years ago, that we can just pick up where things left off in, in, in 2016. And I think that's a very dangerous assumption because the security landscape really has changed significantly. Uh, nuclear risk has increased quite a bit over the past four years. You know, while the number of warheads has, has decreased, you know, what we've seen is the introduction of more destabilizing systems that I think increase the risk of nuclear use through miscalculation. Uh, we've seen a lot of countries expand their nuclear doctrines, meaning they consider using nuclear weapons in an expanded number of circumstances. And we're seeing an increased number of proliferation threats. I mean, when we talk about proliferation, people you know, tend to gravitate towards Iran and North Korea. But we've seen some very kind of loose and dangerous rhetoric coming from Saudi Arabia. A lot of barriers to nuclear weapons have been uh, broken down in, in, in South Korea. Uh, so that risk landscape has also really increased. And then complicating that, you know, we have a lot of challenges that are going to face US diplomatic efforts to try to get nonproliferation and arms control priorities back on track. You know, first, I, I can't underscore this enough, you know, from our sort of position in Washington, you know, looking at how to advance our goals in, in, in 2021, you know, we're faced quite consistently with the credibility deficit that Washington is facing. You know, after four years of having kind of pulled back from international agreements, not just in the arms control space, uh, but, but just writ large. Uh, and a lot of mixed messages coming from the Trump administration about US policies in the nuclear space. You know, all of that just complicates US diplomatic efforts because we have to reestablish sort of our, the idea of US good faith and kind of reestablish what US um, arms control and nonproliferation priorities really are. 
you know, related to that, I, I would say the tools of statecraft that the United States has typically relied upon to advance its arms control and non-proliferation interests have been damaged. Uh, I, I hesitate to say anything about sanctions in front of George because he knows far more about it than, than I do. But, you know, from my vantage point, watching how the Trump administration has tried to wield sanctions against Iran and, and North Korea, you know, he has, he, he's damaged this a, a, as a tool. I mean, we now have you know, critical allies and partners that um, you know, are th actively thinking if they need to develop channels to circumvent US sanctions in the future uh, and, and feeling like they don't actually need to implement US sanctions uh, because of the manner in which, in which they've been, they've been um, misused. Uh, so we, we have to also then think about you know, how we kind of readjust that toolkit. And finally, you know, I would just say, as we become more and more removed from generations that remember nuclear testing, that remember the use of nuclear weapons in World War II, you know, the nuclear threat continues to become less and less tangible, uh, particularly when you compare it to threats that people actually feel like they they face and impact their daily lives, like terrorism, like climate change. That you know, coupled with the idea that. Um, coupled with you know, the idea of disarmament, which to many people feels like an impossible task that they don't understand how to get there, you know, that does just create a lot of apathy in the general public. Um, of course, you know, I wouldn't apply that to anyone who is staying up this late to listen to, uh, to, to a course on, on, on nuclear weapons. But I highlight that because I think it is really critical and something that we consistently face in our work. How do we make this threat relatable and how do we make this threat real? Um, I included this, um, this piece, this excerpt from the Washington Post, you know, from January of, of 2019, you know, two years ago, that just indicates that there are a lot of people in the United States who don't even want to read news about nuclear weapons, and they just prefer to ignore it. So I think that comes back to that idea of, of apathy, that it's just hard to get people to actually want to take action on this. Um, so finally, you know, just to talk briefly then about some of our key policy priorities for 2021. You know, there's four that I'm really going to highlight here. You know, we cover a much broader range of, of we cover a much broader portfolio than, than what I'm listing here. You know, we also do work on chemical weapons, biological weapons, but, um, but these are going to be, be critical for us. So, you know, first, you know, stabilizing and building on the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran. You know, second, creating space for diplomacy to, to denuclearize and build peace with North Korea. Um, third, you know, reducing US, U.S. nuclear weapons excess. And then finally, you know, reviving and advancing U.S.-Russia uh, nuclear arms control. So first, you know, looking at the nuclear deal with Iran, you know, a short-term goal for the Arms Control Association, you know, in the next few months is supporting a return to full compliance by the United States and Iran, you know, with, with the deal. I'm not sure how much you know you've talked about the JCPOA you know over this past week, but you know we view it as an effective, verifiable agreement that really halted a decades-long nuclear crisis with Iran and began to restore confidence in the peaceful nature of, of, of the program. Of course, you know the United States withdrew from the deal. Uh, Iran began to violate, you know, in response to the U.S. sanctions pressure campaign, and we're really at a tipping point where it's unclear, you know, if if the deal is going to survive. You know, we feel very strongly that if Biden sends a strong signal to Iran. Iran, uh, that he's willing to waive sanctions and, you know, and, and work with Iran for both sides to return to the deal, that it's still possible and, and desirable from a U.S. perspective to, to save this. Uh, so we're going to be spending a lot of time in the next few months, you know, reminding members of Congress why the deal was important and why they should support this return to, to, to full compliance by, by both parties. Uh, similarly, we're going to be asking for, for grassroots help uh, in, you know, in pressuring you know, members of Congress, again, just to support this approach. Um, relatedly then, kind of looking out over the year, uh, we're also going to be looking at, you know, proposing options for building on the nuclear deal. This is something that Biden says that he, he wants to do. Um, so this is a really great space, you know, for an organization like ours to be in because we can think more long term about what, uh, uh, about what, you know, U.S. nonproliferation policy towards the Middle East should be and start to think about, you know, is there a way to build on the deal that takes into these other, that takes these other, you know, regional nuclear threats into account? Is there a way to think more creatively about ballistic missile restrictions, you know, in, in the region? So some of this year, like I said, is going to be spent kind of thinking through, you know, these ideas, you know, bouncing some of them off policymakers, off other experts, and then ideally kind of crafting, you know, a plan to take this approach forward that again kind of engages the general public and the media to help us kind of push these ideas with policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, so then moving on to uh, North Korea. Um, 
you know, we have, I would say, sort of two goals within this next year when it comes to North Korea. You know, first, one thing that I think is critically important is just increasing the knowledge about North Korea's nuclear policies, you know, within the US Congress. I mean, one thing that we really found during, you know, the Trump administration's attempts to negotiate with North Korea uh, was that oftentimes, you know, you know, members of Congress were acting in a way that they thought was supportive of diplomacy, uh, but really caused problems uh, due to kind of misunderstandings of the US South Korean um, alliance, uh, but also just a general misunderstanding about, you know, the most effective way to try to advance denuclearization with North Korea. So, you know, congressional education push, you know, ensuring that they understand the program, that they understand North Korea's nuclear doctrine, um, that's going to be big. And then relatedly, you know, we're also thinking about, you know, how to restructure US policy towards negotiations with North Korea going forward. I mean, we did a very extensive sort of look back at the Trump-Kim summits that took place in 2018 and 2019, um, the rhetoric, the positions that came out of both sides. And, you know, we strongly believe that the maximalist demands by both parties and the mixed messages about the intentions about what actually constitutes denuclearization and peace building um, were really problematic in stymieing talks and, and helped contribute to the stalemate. Um, so we are, are going to be pushing for a much more step-by-step -step approach that actually rewards North Korean, um, that rewards uh, tangible North Korean steps towards denuclearization, you know, with areas that meet North Korea's demands. So that could be limited sanctions relief, that could be modifying US North Korean exercises, uh, that could be, you know, thinking about you know, the, the initial sort of political um, relations, you know, setting up liaison offices, you know, ending the Korean War, you know, putting all of that into a bucket together and kind of figuring out how that step-by-step -step approach that can lead to denuclearization will reduce nuclear risk in the short term and, and help build confidence between the two parties. Um, and part of this then is kind of embedding this idea of denuclearization within this transformative approach to negotiations. Uh, and this is something that I think has stymied the United States and its policy towards North Korea for some time, uh, is that we tend to view uh, denuclearization in a vacuum, that we pursue it. And then on the side, you know, we have our security policy, you know, that's directed sort of towards the region. Uh, so what does a transformative policy look like that advances denuclearization while understanding that in order for North Korea to denuclearize, the security environment has to change. Um, so we're going to be kind of thinking a lot about that, um, you know, trying to flesh out a little bit more what that looks like. And then again, you know, trying to plant the seeds, you know, with, um, with the policymakers about sort of how they can pursue that strategy. And then with Congress as to how they can actually sort of support that. Um, so that's where we are on, on, on North Korea. Um, now I, this is an area of reducing nuclear weapons excess where I don't lead our work at the Arms Control Association. So um, you'll have to forgive me if, uh, if I'm a, a little less uh, verbose or, or, or detailed, but I'm uh, plagiarizing significantly from my colleagues work here. But we have really, I'd say, two goals in this area. You know, first, uh, we wanna see in the next year a reduction of the role that nuclear weapons play in US security. And this really is to combat sort of what we have viewed as sort of a mission creep for US nuclear weapons, particularly over the past four years when we've seen an expansion of the circumstances under which the United States would consider using nuclear weapons, including you know, very absurd ideas like um, using nuclear weapons to respond to a cyber attack or using nuclear weapons to respond to an act of terrorism. Um, so, you know, we we're going to be pushing for, you know, either declaring that the sole purpose of the U.S. nuclear deterrent, uh, nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack, you know, or even stronger, you know, a, a no first use policy, meaning the United States would never use nuclear weapons first in a conflict. So again, you know, we heavily focused on policymakers, you know, trying to explain to them why this actually benefits U.S. nuclear security. We're going to be heavily engaged with U.S. allies, explaining to them that this doesn't put their alliance security at risk. And then again, you know, a lot of work with media and grassroots ensuring, you know, that, that they're also putting pressure on, on their policymakers uh, and, and, and that, you know, and that they're hearing from their constituents that they need to be taking steps to actually reduce nuclear risk. And then related to that, you know, we want to adjust US spending um, on nuclear weapons, you know, to reflect that narrow sort of nuclear role. Uh, you know, the United States right now is in the process of 
um, of, of investing in sort of new elements of all three legs of its nuclear triad, the submarine based leg, you know, the ICBM you know, based leg, you know, and, and the air based leg. And we're investing in systems that we don't need and, and don't make us, you know, safer. I mean, looking here, for instance, you know, I have on here the, the nuclear armed submarine launched cruise missile. I mean, this is a system that, that, um, uh, that, that, that the Navy itself doesn't even want, but policymakers, you know, like the idea of investing in these new systems. Um, they think that uh, they meet sort of perceived gaps um, with, within the US deterrent. Um, but again, thinking about how these policies work together, you know, if we reduce the role of nuclear weapons, you know, that also strengthens our argument in saying that we don't need all of these more advanced capabilities. Um, so now to, to finish up, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon because she really leads our work in the US uh, Russia nuclear arms control and can speak to this part uh, much more effectively than I can. So Shannon, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelsey. So as Kelsey mentioned, I'm going to just briefly outline what ACA's goals are regarding the new strategic arms reduction treaty, most commonly known as New START. So New START expires in just about three weeks from now on February 5th, but the treaty allows for an extension of up to five years so long as the presidents of both countries agree to it. ACA has definitely been emphasizing that in the case, if New START does expire, it will be the first time in nearly 50 years that the two countries that own more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons would be without any observed constraints on the size of their arsenals. Bottom line up front, ACA firmly supports a full five-year extension so as to ensure sufficient time for talks between the United States and Russia on potential follow-on follow -on arms control agreements and to guard against potentially sparking a new arms race. To break that down a little, a little bit more, first and foremost, as I have listed on the slide, our goal is to convince the incoming Biden administration to agree to extend New START by a full five years. Emphasis on that five years part. Russia had offered in December 2019 to extend New START immediately and without any preconditions. And since the US presidential election in November, Moscow has said that that offer does remain on the table and we have been encouraging Biden to take that deal. However, reports have been emerging that some of Biden's advisors favor an extension for a shorter period of time, say one or two years, so as to gain leverage to exact concessions from Russia during negotiations on a potential follow-on agreement. ACA has been working to kind of push back against that argument of leverage. Um, the Trump administration had a very similar view to that to that one on leverage, believing that the Russians are so desperate for ex an extension that they would be willing to agree to anything in order to get it. But this has not borne out to be true as we've seen particularly over the past year. In essence, we are arguing that New START is simply way too important to be gambled away on this low probability bet that an, a shorter extension would make Russia more willing to offer concessions. Second, another one of our goals is related to the existence of time constraints in this situation. There's the time constraint on the incoming Biden administration having only 16 days from inauguration to new starts or expiration to secure an extension. To kind of reiterate my previous, the previous goal I outlined, taking the good deal already on the table would be smart. But there is another time constraint and that's on negotiating a potential new follow on arms control agreement between the United States and Russia. By extending New START for a full five years, we will ensure there is sufficient time to hold what will inevitably be complex and time consuming talks on follow on arms control agreements that could be aimed at a variety of things. And I have just three listed here to include enhancing strategic stability and a lot of different things kind of fit into that, as well as further reducing the US and Russian nuclear arsenals, as well as tackling difficult issues such as non strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. An extension of just a few years most likely wouldn't be able to adequate, adequately undertake these discussions between the US and Russia while five years would. To sum it up, our goals are to see an extension of New START for five years and then with that time now available and the limits in place on US and Russian strategic nuclear arsenals, we would work on what might come, come next. In pursuit of these goals on New START, ASA has published op-eds and issue briefs We've reached out to members of Congress to discuss and push forward related pieces of legislation, and we brought together others in the nuclear community on a letter to the Biden transition team in November, which included this very argument for a five-year extension. We've yet to hear a final decision from Biden on how long of an extension he'd go for, though he has repeatedly expressed his support for the treaty itself. 
So as these in these final weeks leading up to New Start's extension, we've been really pushing forward for the full five years saying that ad nauseum. I will end the New Start talk here. I didn't delve too much into detail, for instance, on what the Trump admin was proposing uh, over the past year, but this was just kind of a rough overview of where we stand now in the final weeks before New Start's expiration. Thanks. And uh, that actually concludes our presentation. So um, thank you so much for joining us in our virtual tour. Uh, I hope next time we can host you in person. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Shannon and I look forward to trying to answer your questions in the discussion group. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Kelsey and Shannon. That was very substantive and uh, very informative. So thank you very much. I think we are now, uh, rather, than, rather than field questions in the plenary, I think it'd be probably better to just break up into our small groups for uh, about, what, 20, 20 minutes? I hope you enjoyed the breakout groups and discussions with some of our guests and, and again among one another. We, we come to the last session of our time together and we admit that you know so much that's been enriching of this week has been the diversity in our culture, cultures, the number of countries engaged here, the, the differences in our age cohort and uh, a lot of folks, undergraduates, but some other people, graduate students and other people, faculty and activists and various other roles in the arms control world. And so, you know, in some respects, we feel like um, this is our, our, our only sort of ethnocentric panel, if you will, only in the sense that the three good people with us um, are all people who are students in the United States and are working in the United States. But we think very much their three individual cases tell us a lot about what it means to get involved in this particular field of uh, either not just study, but activism and actually somebody paying you to do some of this work. And they represent three different journeys, three particular stories for how they got to be involved in, in Washington, DC uh, as our kind of case study organizational dynamic. And we're delighted to have each of them. So Monica, Shannon, and Aaron, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can do a little self-introduction, say something about your stories. And I, I suspect what advice you'd give to somebody uh, who's about to graduate soon or about to head into the world of searching for a job in, in the arms and nuclear area. The floor is yours. And I don't know if you've determined in order yourselves or Monica, why don't you begin then? Sure, I can start. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Monica Montgomery. Um, I work at in Washington DC at an organization called the Council for a Livable World. I'm the advocacy coordinator at the Council for a Livable World. And I also work at our sister research organization called the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. I am a 2015 undergraduate graduate from the University of Notre Dame, where I studied political science and peace studies. Um, and I think I'll get a little bit into my story about how I got to the field first, and then I'll talk about what I do briefly. So um, when I went to Notre Dame, I knew that I wanted to study political science, but I didn't really know much about what interested me. Um, I became started becoming more focused in peace and security issues, and it was actually in Jerry Powers, Professor Powers' uh, junior seminar in peace studies that I had an opportunity to learn more about nuclear disarmament and um, joined a trip of students on a trip to uh, the Vatican for a conference on nuclear disarmament. This, uh, I don't know how much you've talked about it this week, but I'm sure you've probably heard somewhat in your lessons uh, about when Pope Francis declared the possession, um, not just the use of nuclear weapons to be immoral in 2017. So this was the conference that I actually got to attend um, with 
Professor Lopez, Powers, Kelsey, uh, Shannon, so some of us gathered here today, Professor Love, I think was there. Um, so it was a really monumental part in my studies where I thought, wow, this is such a cool opportunity. It's really related to my academic interests in peace and security. And I got to meet um, a lot of interesting people there. From that experience, I uh, continued to research nuclear weapons and disarmament in my studies. I ended up um, doing an internship, internship actually at the Arms Control Association, no less, um, before my senior year of college and really uh, learned a lot from the mentorship of Kelsey uh, as well, worked a lot under her and um, became more interested as I was going into my senior year at Notre Dame. So continuing to learn into this field, uh, I ended up coming back to DC after graduation. And I did a fellowship at an organization called the Friends Committee on National Legislation. It's the uh, Quakers, so the Religious Society of Friends in Washington, DC, their lobby. So they lobby on peace and security issues and have a specific program that works on nuclear disarmament. Um, from that, I got a new job, which is at the Council for a Liberal World, which does similar work. So that's kind of like the, the resume here to there of how I got to where I'm at now. I would say a lot of that was driven just by continuing to be interested and learning and exploring anything that that drove me. Um, so whether it was a research paper I was doing in class or following nuke experts on Twitter or attending conferences or online events, um, which are more common today because of the reality of the pandemic than they were back then or on campus events, um, I really became more interested in this field and that's how it's led me here. I think above all, what got me interested in the field in the first place was um, the moral voice that the Catholic Church put out on nuclear weapons at that first conference I attended. I thought, wow, this is really my studies. I'm interested in American politics. I'm interested in national security. Moreover, I'm interested in making the world a better place. And there's no weapons worse than nuclear weapons. And I felt called um, by the Pope's message, by the message of many of the activists in this field that nuclear weapons are immoral, they're dangerous, and we should work to reduce the threats posed by them. And that's what I do in my daily work, even though I might forget that sometimes, because a lot of time my daily work is sending a lot of emails and being on a lot of Zoom meetings and looking at a lot of Excel spreadsheet lists of votes taken in Congress and staffers' names and not realizing it's definitely easy to talk about how that uh, this vision is what I work towards, but on a daily basis, it doesn't feel like that. So on a daily basis, what I do at our organization is actually work uh, to ed educate, elect, and lobby members of Congress and their staff on nuclear arms control and non-proliferation non issues. So at the Council for a Livable World, we actually um, endorse federal candidates for the US Senate and the US House. So that means working with their election campaigns, um, interviewing the candidates themselves, asking them what they think about a world without nuclear weapons, what they think about engaging with North Korea on Iran, what they think about the Trump administration's proposal to build this new nuclear weapon, evaluating them, educating them, and then actually endorsing them and raising money for them. Because uh, we believe that only by uh, really building champions for our issue in Congress and by doing that is putting money behind their election campaigns, which is how American politics works, we're going to be able to make champions and change in Congress. On a day-to-day -day basis, so when we're not in election cycle, uh, I spend a lot of my time working with Hill offices actually on legislation or on issues in the news that come up. So that means, um, for example, the past two weeks, uh, the issue of presidential launch authority has become a hot topic because President Donald Trump cited in our view, an insurrection on the US Capitol. Uh, he was met with a lot of backlash as we see he's being impeached by Congress right now and was blocked from all social media. But in fact, he has sole authority over the US nuclear arsenal. He is the one person in the United States that has control in the decision to launch a nuclear attack. Um, there was a lot of debate in Congress and in the public um, discourse about, oh, well, the military can stop him or someone can stop a deranged nuclear attack. But in fact, the president under US policy is the only one who has the authority to launch a nuclear attack. 
So what that means for my day to day is that we've been spending a lot of time reaching out to offices, telling them, telling them the policy on sole authority, sending them messaging blurbs that they could use on tweets, and actually working with members who have bills that address this issue. So for example, there's a bill led by Senator Ed Markey in the Senate and Representative Ted Lieu in the House that would restrict the first use of nuclear weapons. It would require the president to go to Congress before he were to launch a nuclear, or she, to launch a nuclear first strike. That's something that um, we've worked with their, their office. They're actually re-releasing the bill in the new Congress tomorrow, work with their office in getting a press release out, um, getting other members to sign on. So in that way, obviously, that feels a lot more of like an exciting day um, because it's working on legislation that can actually make a change. In reality, Congress is largely strongly in favor of our US nuclear arsenal. So we have champions that are fully um, in support of arms control, non-proliferation, and some who will come out and say that they believe we should disarm. But those are honestly few and far between. And a lot of our work is um, finding niche interests in members and finding crisis moments or policy points that can get them to support uh, a reduction or a new policy that could lead us down the road towards nuclear risk reduction. Yeah, I can go on and on about what that means. And a lot of our work also um, is about re reducing the overall defense budget, which is a, a topic that we're able to find a lot more champions for, um, because even though it's it's it, and a lot more opponents to as well, but there's a lot of uh, bloat and waste and fraud in the US defense budget. And a lot of that is directly tied to our nuclear weapons. So that's an issue that we spend a lot of time with. And every year Congress has to pass a budget for the, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, um, so that provides a lot of opportunities. I don't know, I, I can just go into a few words of, I don't wanna, uh, I don't, I'll finish up with my few words of advice and then pass it over. Um, I think I hinted on some of them in the beginning, but I would say some of the parts that have felt, led me to find success in this field um, and be in a position now, only two years out of college where I actually have a lot of responsibility and advocacy in our organization is that I, why I've tried to keep my interests quite broad, understanding all things um, that relate to our work, regional issues, specific US nuclear weapon system, Russia, it's, it's important to find a niche, what I've found. And what my niche is understanding Congress. Um, so a lot of people in our field are great experts on issues, but sometimes they don't understand the political realities or they just don't have time to understand how difficult and how nuanced Congress is. So being able to be someone who can translate um, policy issues when a new report comes out or when something, a crisis moment happens as we've seen in the past two weeks into actually having contacts on the Hill and Senator and representatives offices and knowing how to translate that material through briefings and fact sheets and emails and podcasts and tweet messaging is something that um, has allowed me to, I think, continue to grow in this field. And not that, I'm not saying to be successful, you need to become a Congress expert, but find something that really interests you and that you can offer um, and continue to grow. And through that, you'll be able to continue uh, to rise up. And if you enjoy it, continue to stay in the field. The one other thing that I'll just add is the value of mentorship, which is something that I really uh, have benefited from. I would say in the beginning, I think it's a lot more important than it is now. It's still important, but in the beginning, the nuclear field can seem very daunting and intimidating. Um, it can be very elitist. It can be very full of jargon and experts. And you go, how will I ever have a position here? And I say that the reason I felt those same thoughts and I still feel them all the time, but the reason that I would I have the confidence to continue going on was hearing support from mentors and colleagues in the field. So I spoke about Kelsey and Jerry who played a pivotal role in when I was first getting into field. Um, Shannon and Aaron are both close friends of mine that and Shannon and I work very close in our offices, which are separate organizations, but having someone to talk to and learn from, whether they're above you or beside you or at a lower position than you is something that I found to be really important and helpful. So with that, I will pass it to Shannon. I'm passing it to Aaron. We had determined, she and I on the side determined order. So Aaron, take the floor. For two type A did not have an order. Uh, <laughs> So hi, I'm Erin, and I'm currently a Global Affairs and Peace Studies master's student at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and through my master's, I've been using peace studies as an alternative framework to this traditionally very security studies space. 
And so as part of this master's program, which I highly recommend, I got to spend 10 months with, oh no, 10 months, six months with uh, King's College London. And I worked with their war studies department on multilateral arms control initiatives. And so this was a really interesting opportunity to engage other countries on their perspectives on arms control and proliferation, which like this is an incredibly diverse group. And I think this is a huge part of the value of this program is um, understanding how other people approach an issue that's typically seen as just a US, Russia, or even beyond that, just a P5 issue is really important, especially as we need to find more creative solutions as we get lower and lower in um, the numbers of nuclear weapons. And so that was a really interesting opportunity. And also the ability to kind of step into academia after working in policy was quite interesting. And so at the same time, I'm also an associate program director with an organization called Girl Security. And Girl Security is a nonprofit that seeks to close the gender gap in national security. And we do this through education and high school programs and working with the Girl Scouts and other organizations like that. Um, we do it through practical training, which is like simulations and war games. And as Monica mentioned, the critically important part, which is mentorship, and we have a phase mentorship network. Um, and so that's been really interesting uh, for me to work with high school students, college students, and connect national security issues to personal security. It also helps me contextualize nuclear issues within other national security priorities. And it's been interesting to see how issues like disinformation will affect the ability to create effective nuclear policy and things I never had thought of. Um, and so that's been really interesting. And after graduation, if all goes well, I'll be working with the Department of Energy in the Office of Nuclear Verification to try and support the next iteration of arms control agreements. And again, figuring out how we can find mechanisms that work for countries who ne don't necessarily trust one another, but still need to work together. Um, and so a little bit on how I got here. So I grew up in New York. I went to a small college in Massachusetts, which is already radical because no one in my family left New York and they're all teachers. And so I went to college to be a teacher as well. But after my first education class, I quickly realized that this was not for me. And I had that classic panic attack of like, what am I gonna do with my life if this is the one thing I'd planned? And so I knew I was interested in security and I didn't really know what that meant. And I took a national security course and I ended up writing about the Iran nuclear deal just as it was happening in spring 2015 and I was instantly fascinated. Um, but I still didn't really know what to do with it and I had um, lived abroad and I'd done a couple internships at human rights organizations and while that's critically important work, it wasn't what I was passionate about and so I ended up just googling arms control or nuclear internships in DC and applying to everything that I found. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get an internship at the Center for Arms Control, which is where Monica is now. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very small DC nuclear community, as you'll see, we're very incestuous. Um, but after working at the center, I was completely hooked on working in nuclear policy. And something that I would advise is I didn't have any courses on nuclear policy in my college. So anytime a class said, write a paper on a topic of your choice that relates, like finding those different lenses to write about nuclear policy, because it also gives you really useful writing samples for when you apply to internships is something that I found to be incredibly helpful. Um, but so I began my career uh, through an internship in DC and I was fortunate enough that a job opened up a few months after graduation. I still had the panic attack of graduating without a job, but we made it. Um, and then I focused, as Monica does, on educating members of Congress and their staff on nuclear issues. And while doing this, I noticed the gap between the nuclear policy community um, and what they wanted members of Congress to know, but also members of Congress have such a wide portfolio, which is like everything. Um, and their incentive structure is to get reelected. Like every member of Congress wants to get reelected. They want to keep their job. And so they care about what their constituents care about. And so I, along with a colleague who's a Scoville fellow, started an education project um, where we taught nuclear weapons 101. Um, and we went to high school students, uh, we went to high schools across the country and specifically her high school in Washington state where the school mascot is a mushroom cloud uh, to kind of gauge students' knowledge about nuclear issues and uh, create a foundational understanding so that regardless of the career path they chose, they could still hold their members of Congress accountable. Um, and this was something that I had to fight to do. My organization was not super keen on it happening, but there was a lot of uh, presenting my case. And I think learning to advocate for yourself, especially in such a small space is so important. 
um, and learning to make space for yourself as well. Um, and so that was really helpful in understanding that um, and talking to students that there's less interest in $1.2 trillion in nuclear modernization and more interest in things like healthcare or student loan forgiveness and translating that to effective policy change and things that like Monica and Shannon are actively doing every day um, is really helpful. And so getting a master's, um, I really wanted to step back from DC and get a new perspective on this issue. And as Monica alluded to, it can be hard to kind of maintain the larger perspective of why we're doing what we're doing. And I think I really needed to step back and assess that for myself. And to be completely honest, I was told that as a woman in the field, if I didn't have a master's, I would reach a cap pretty soon. And so that was a very interesting comment and something that I thought a lot about and I decided to get a master's in peace studies because it provided a framework that I could apply to nuclear issues but I could also apply to other issues in case I decided that I was not interested in nuclear non-proliferation anymore in grad school which was something that I was potentially prepared for um, but while in graduate school I keep finding myself pulled back into the nuclear world and I'm happy to be there and re-entering it with a different perspective. Um, and so I will close up with a little bit of advice. I think it's really important to see the value in the things that you do and don't like. Like I did plenty of internships where I was like, I, this is important, I just don't like it. And that teaches you just as much as the internships that you do like. And so like acknowledging the value of that, I think is really helpful. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to people. Everyone loves to talk about themselves and maybe don't email like the president of Brookings, um, but if you email other people in the organization and ask about their work, they're generally quite friendly. We're all nerds and just really like to talk about what we're working on. And so I think that's a really good inroad. Um, and also the working in this space is, uh, it's a very small space. And so it's a combination of like luck and also being prepared for that like opening and luck because there are so few positions. Um, understanding that it takes a bit of time um, is quite frustrating, but also it pays off. And then just reiterating again what Monica said in terms of uh, creating a horizontal and vertical network because the horizontal is like your peers and those are the people that you can go to when your boss is driving you insane and you need to decide if that's the hill you're going to die on or not um, or if maybe you just need to like take a walk around the block and then go back to your work. Um, I know many friends have been <laughs> quite helpful in that debate in my head um, but also they're the people who like celebrate their wins with you who um, who are just really, who understand what it's like to be in this very niche, interesting space. And I think that's really important. And then your vertical network are the people who really help you ask the critical questions of yourself and also like why you're doing the work that you're doing. Um, and I think that's a really helpful perspective. And so um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's just kind of like my experience in a nutshell. And oh yeah, I'm excited to hear what Shannon has to say. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, well, Monica and Erin have really set the groundwork, I feel like, so I'll give a rundown of how I got here and advice that I've picked up along the way. Um, some of it will definitely be a little bit, I'll try and cut out the parts that Erin and Monica have already said, because apparently we all share a brain. Um, but good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Bugis. I am a research assistant at the Arms Control Association, and you all have probably heard that way too much today, but uh, stick with me. In my role, I report directly to and work with the Director for Disarmament and Threat Reduction Policy, Kingston Reef. My portfolio includes work, for instance, on the defense budget and multilateral treaties like the Open Skies Treaty, as well as nuclear testing, so the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT. As you've heard earlier this evening, U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control, like New Start, is, I describe that as the bulk of my work. That is what I've been focusing on, especially over the past year and a half that I've been at ACA. For an example, one of the main things I do on New Start, on the New Start front for ACA, is help run what we call the Friends of New Start Initiative. This is a group of about 40 of our colleagues that we gather together to share information, discuss developments related to New Start, and determine the best strategy to secure the treaty's extension. What I enjoy most about my job is the research and writing part. It is so important to stay on top of what is happening in each area that I cover. And so I dedicate a solid portion of my week, probably even my day, to reading. Uh, reading news reports, but also research papers and government reports, kind of like anything I can get my hands on. 
this research then goes on to inform the writing I do at ACA, which includes op-eds, issue briefs, articles for a monthly journal, communications with those on the Hill, like the policymakers. I want to, so after describing my ACA work, I want to back up a little bit to my time at Notre Dame and then walk you through what my path to ACA looked like and hopefully dispense some helpful advice along the way. I graduated from ND in May 2016. My majors were peace studies and English, and I also had a minor in business economics. Though many people asked me about becoming a teacher, I would always reply that I did the English major so I could learn to write well, which would help me as I pursued a role in the peace studies field. My sister, who's an English teacher, was always trying to get me to change my mind. She obviously did not. I like very much where I am, where I am. When job hunting as a senior, I was initially firmly set on the type of job that I have right now, research. My focus at that time, so far as issues go, was on human rights. I had worked for a professor through a program at Notre Dame on his project, studying early warning systems and examining the role of the military in mass atrocity, and I had wanted to continue my work in that area. Unfortunately, as graduation kept, crept closer, I was not getting anywhere on the job front. I did also apply for a fellowship, the Scoville Fellowship, which is great. Kelsey actually um, is involved with that program. Um, I was lucky enough to make it to the in-person interview stage, but in the end, I didn't get an offer. And so I graduated in May 2016 without a job. My sister and her family live and lived and continue to live near Notre Dame, and she was expecting her second baby in just a few weeks. So I decided to stick around. Move in with her, I was able to keep one of the jobs that I had as an undergrad student. And I also was put on babysitting duty for her eldest kid, my nephew, especially when she had to go to the hospital. I ended up staying with them for a few weeks before, as luck would have it, a family friend who was in the army was moving to Arlington. And he said I could stay with him and his family. And his wife was also expecting a second baby. So I was put once again on babysitting duty in order to live in their house. So I got free rent, they got a babysitter on call. By this time, it was about July, August of 2016. When I wasn't babysitting, I was networking. And here are a few pieces of advice that I picked up along the way. So as Erin said, do not be afraid to email people. Email every person you may know in the field or in the city you may want to go to to ask them for coffee or for a 30 minute phone call. Obviously in today, day, today's day and age, probably a phone call is better. The worst that can happen in this situation is that they won't respond to your email. But honestly, DC and Notre Dame alumni especially have a pay it forward mentality. And the majority of people honestly did respond to my emails. This initial outreach will serve as a foundation for building your network. Because for every person that you do meet with, and this is probably my biggest piece of advice, do not leave that meeting without the contact information of two to three other people and then reach out to those individuals and do the same exact thing, make it a cycle. Ask someone to meet or talk and then, if they, and then ask if they have anyone they think it would be great for you to talk to. Do not shy away from asking this. One of the first people I met in DC told me that he expects to be asked for something whenever he meets with someone. He's always happy to help people in the field and he said it honestly saves him time if you're just upfront about what you're looking for. So we sat down for coffee and he was like, what do you want when you leave this meeting? And I was kind of taken aback and I was like, well, who can you introduce me to? And he was like, great, let's talk about it. And so just be very, people in DC kind of expect that. And especially when people approach me now, I always say like, what is it that I can do for you? Because I do want to help. So don't be afraid to ask for introductions to people. Um, keep track of everyone you're meeting with and follow up with people. Emails do fall through the cracks, so obviously, respectfully, but it is okay to ping people again or just shoot them a, a note a few months later just to check in. I did a lot of phone calls and coffee dates whenever I could during those months. I pulled the move of ordering a drink at Starbucks and keeping that same cup, even when it became empty, on my table all day long as I met with person after person. Once time allowed me to, with my babysitting obligations, I was also able to pick up a temporary job in Bethesda. And I had additionally taken on a remote internship with the American Relief Coalition for Syria, helping their development team write grants. So they were great in giving me the flexibility in my hours. So it was definitely a busy time. I would be babysitting early in the mornings and evenings, go to my nine to five temp job, 
fit in what at this point were mainly phone calls to continue my networking, do my intern work at night, and apply to lots of jobs whenever I could. This was honestly a route that a lot of people trying to make it in DC take. I am certainly not the only one who was juggling a couple different things to try and make it and find a steady paying job in the city. I submitted about 100 applications during those months. Um, and I would say that's even on the lower side of what I've heard other people do. Um, and what honestly it proved to be most important along my journey to kind of landing here was shaking loose this idea that I only had only could apply for research jobs. I knew I still wanted to work in research and write, but I expanded my job search to also look at communications jobs. I ended up applying for a comms role at the Truman Center for National Policy and Truman National Security Project and was eventually offered that job, which I started in December 2016. At first, this job wasn't exactly what I pictured myself doing in DC. In this role, I primarily assisted Truman members in drafting, editing, publishing op-eds, and writing a daily newsletter for the community. But it was my foot in the door, and it came to be an experience that I am extremely, extremely grateful for. While at Truman, I got to understand how communications works, which I think has served me well. Being passionate and knowing about issues is great, but it only gets you so far unless you know how to talk about them effectively to different audiences. I also got to know the DC community, especially because Truman is a membership organization. So I got to meet all of those in DC as well as outside the Beltway and continue growing my network. I stayed at Truman for about two and a half years. While I did appreciate working in comms, I also, it helped me figure out, so as Aaron said, some things can help you figure out what you do and don't wanna do. And that's also invaluable. And so while I loved comms, I knew that something in me was like, I still wanna to get to research eventually. Um, nuclear non-pro and disarmament have also been longtime interests of mine. And so when I went on staff at Truman, the other staffers weren't really experienced in the nuclear arena. And so they put me in charge of those issues. This allowed me to dig deeper into them than I had before and write the organization's messaging on, for instance, the Trump administration's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. Working at Truman on nuclear issues allowed me to keep expanding my knowledge and grow my interest. And so ACA landed very firmly on my radar as someone that I saw myself, somewhere I saw myself wanting to go to. It helped that my current boss right now is a Truman member. So I knew about his work when I was on staff at, at Truman. I had also known Kelsey for a few years at that point too. So I was bugging her constantly about opening set ACA and how to enter the nuke space. I ended up joining ACA in July, 2019, and I'm always very, very grateful that they brought me onto their team. It was certainly a steep learning curve going from comms to policy slash research and going from a broad range of foreign policy and national security issues to a very specific focus on arms control. I am still learning and being challenged every day, but I love that. And that's, I think, as it should be. I shared some of my thoughts on networking earlier and what I'd like to end on is this piece of advice for you to just think broader about what you envision your career path to look like. For sure have parts that you would that you want to stick to. So for me that was writing, but be flexible in how you can apply it. Don't run the risk of dismissing valuable learning opportunities because you might think they don't fit into the exact plan that you had sketched out to yourself or you'll, you'll you think they'll knock you off course. They could be opportunities that give you a new set of skills or prompt you to reevaluate what, sh what issues you'd like to learn, you'd like to focus on. If you told me in college that I would enter comms, I would have laughed it off. I no way I would have imagined myself entering that field where I would have to be glued to Twitter all day. Um, but from where I'm standing now, I am so thankful I worked in comms because it allowed me to gain new skills and taught me how I can now better talk about my research and work on arms control. I had also first imagined uh, my career thinking I'd be in human rights, possibly international development in that space, but I learned that personally my interests were actually in the arms control space. Things change, and I learned it is best to be flexible and be open to different opportunities, opportunities I might have dismissed at a first glance, but when I looked into it, it would be great for my career. It's also important to get to know people in this space, get to know them and their work, but also as people, DC is about who you know. Um, which again is great for your career, but people will go the extra mile for you if they knew, know you a little bit better. So just really talk to people about things other than nukes as well. Uh, we're all people, I promise. <laughs> so 
I want to end it there. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you to the three of you. This is uh, a, a lot to absorb. Uh, and this time we're going to stay in a group as a whole. The floor is totally open. You can ask a question of one of the people or just pose the question generally to all three and they can take turns. Anything around the notion of how to get into the field, various forms of study, it's all open, wherever you're from. I have a question for Monica. Hi, Monica. Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> um, I was wondering, could you talk a little bit more about how you use like niche issues to appeal to congressmen who, you know, might not be for complete disarmament, but reduction? For sure. Yeah, so um, it definitely is a lot about uh, learning and catering to the niche uh, interests, as you say. So a lot of times when we're working with members, there are occasions that we work with actual congressmen and women themselves, but more often than not, we're working with their staff. So a lot of their staff look like me. They're young. A lot of the staff are um, older staff, senior staff, or might be in their 30s, 40s, some um, older than that as well that are up at higher levels in the offices. So a lot of the time getting an issue on a member of Congress's agenda is by getting their staff to be paying attention to that. So one thing that we do at the center and the council is we hold briefings for staff members. We also hold member level only briefings about really far and wide topics. So sometimes these briefings are about nuclear security. So like plutonium and um, uranium modern or modernization and containment. Sometimes they are about North Korea, Iran. We're planning one upcoming on launch authority as I was talking about earlier. And in these briefings, we are able to hear them ask questions as the staff. And then a lot of my job is following up with the staff that ask questions, kind of being a past. Hey, I heard you have interest in this. Do you have time for a follow on 30 minute conversation? We can schedule time to talk. And sometimes with staff that I already have relationships, they'll reach out to me and be like, hey, my boss uh, saw this in the news or my boss is interested in introducing a bill on the role of um, artificial intelligence and missile defense. And I'm like, oh boy, that is not my expertise, but I'm certainly not gonna tell you that. I'm gonna read some stuff on it and I'm gonna talk to our experts and I'm gonna find a way to get you to be interested in this. And by building that relationship, whatever it is, and a lot of times it's easily identifiable by them, you're able to open a door and they're gonna to come to you on more issues and you're able to get them then when, when I'm trying to get that same member to take a vote to vote against funding for the new intercontinental ballistic missile, they're already gonna be much more likely to take my call and much more likely to listen to the things that I'm um, trying to put out in front of them and why we may not be able to get them to change completely their view on nuclear weapons. We have seen that this is proven um, to be successful. It's all about relationship building and catering to whatever needs they are. We're first and foremost a resource to them and that's what we always present ourselves as. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I have a question. So um, thank you for your presentation, a inspirational presentation. It's really good. I learned a lot from you. So uh, from your perspective, do you think that uh, this world this generation, this field needs new specialists uh, in the field uh, of nuclear disarmament or nuclear weapons. So can you specifically enumerate some other opportunities for those who are interested in? Yeah, so I can jump in right here. Um, so the Scoville Fellowship that I had mentioned earlier, I highly recommend looking into that. Um, they offer, I think it's about nine months um, and you kind of, you apply for the fellowship and if you get the fellowship, you kind of get your choice of a handful of organizations to work at and you can go work at one similar to ACA. Um, there are a handful of arms control ones in there. Um, I would definitely, there's a couple job boards that I think are pretty popular among like the arms control space. So Aaron and Monica, you're definitely gonna have to help me here. But one that I had used a lot was one called Global Jobs. And uh, people are pretty good about putting up their 
um, postings there so you can kind of see it all in one place. Um, if you're DC focused, there are a couple job resources that like there's one called Tom Minantos that you can sign up for and kind of get that full rundown of everything that's available. Um, and so that's definitely more DC focused. So if you're not looking at DC, I'm sorry. Um, but for anyone right there, that's a that's a great one. There's one called like Brad Traverse or Traverse. I don't know how to say it. Um, but I would definitely recommend looking at that. And then lastly, I would recommend putting together a list of organizations that are kind of like your top places you want to go to and just get in the habit of checking them very often. Because at least speaking in ACA's experience, whenever we have an opening, it's usually a pretty quick we start apps now, we'll have them open, and then we just immediately start interviewing. Um, so it's best if you just kind of are checking those organizations that you're really, really attached to. Erin um, and Monica, let me know if I missed anything major. Please jump in. I think those are all really good points. And I think another list that's DC National Security is the John Quincy Adams Society, and they're very like national security focused. Um, and also internationally, there's ways to get involved through like the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and other international bodies that work on nonproliferation issues. But I think just reiterating what Shannon said in terms of looking at the organizations that you're really interested in and personally, uh, a good way to find those is when you're reading about these issues, looking at who is writing and then seeing where they work because I think that's a really good, like I didn't even know where to start to find organizations and I found that to be really helpful. Um, and just a side note in terms of the need for more diversity in this space, I think that is a really important point. And I think when you interview with organizations, explaining how you have a different experience and so you ask different questions and the nuclear community needs different questions and new questions to be asked to create a better policy because for so long, nuclear policy has been created by an elite few. I'm sure you've talked about the nuclear priesthood during this. Um, and so I think understanding that better nuclear policy comes from more diverse perspectives is also a really important thing to touch on when you do talk to the organizations. Um, but I would also say, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the um, listserv. I will come back to you if I think of it. I just fully totally blanked on the name. Monica, do you have any other suggestions? No, I think you guys covered a lot. Um, just on the on the diversity of of background and thought, I think that's really important, and it's a conversation that comes up more often than not in our space right now. Um, obviously, Erin, Shannon, and I are females, and that's different from the norm. But we're also also all white, and that is largely what the DC nuclear policy field looks like, and it's something that is becoming more and more often named as an issue. Um, as nuclear policy, we've since the beginning of the nuclear age, we've seen a lot of change and we have seen reductions in, in uh, the US nuclear arsenal and strategic stability talks with Russia, but in large part, the problem still exists and in, in, in even larger part, proliferation risks are still present. And a lot of people point to the lack of diversity of thought and backgrounds as a reason why we're not able to move forward in achieving nuclear zero and achieving um, really drastic measures in disarmament. So I think that as you see, obviously, Aaron, Shannon, and I have different backgrounds, but we also have similar ones. But while all of us uh, are in a similar position, we have different interests and as more different uh, academic backgrounds and geographical backgrounds can come into the field, I, I do believe and I think there's a lot of desire for that in the field right now, um, whether that's more scientific or more theological, moral, or more traditional political science, national security. It's, it's definitely desired and it's definitely necessary. Um, and I hope and believe will prove useful in working towards our, our collective goal. Do we have another question? Well then, I'm going to ask a question of Jerry Powers if he's there hiding behind his G letter. <laughs> Jerry, if I'm a young Catholic who wants to get involved in this on the church side, what's the equivalent of the Arms Control Association for young Catholics? Um, I've, uh, I've had students who have done internships and in, uh, my and Drew's old office, the Office of International Justice and Peace at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, 
Um, and some some have also done a year or two long or two year long fellowships there after graduation. Uh, I've had students work at the at the Holy See mission to the UN agencies in Geneva and Vienna. Uh, and some of that work is on arms control because of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency is based there as part of that. Uh, and, and some of the arms control uh, work takes place in Geneva and Vienna. Um, uh, and then there's some other, you know, Pax Christi International is a international Catholic independent peace organization that that does works on a whole range of issues, including nuclear weapons. Um, so those are some. Those are some of. There aren't that many. Um, it's a, but there. Those are some of the main ones that where yeah, where you can work. And Marianne or Drew, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to take this up uh, in my closing remarks, but I think Americans are too focused on D.C. I mean, I think I think that. Uh, there are great opportunities at the UN in New York. The UN has a couple of its disarmament uh, uh, offices there in, immediately in New York. They have internships and other, other offices of the UN in New York have, have, have uh, uh, internships available. The, uh, the Holy See Mission always has several uh, interns there at any one time. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, we, we had a first in, in 2017 when uh, Dan, Dan Rosenberg was a student of mine here at Georgetown and I like to claim he's the first Jew to serve in a Vatican delegation to the UN, but he was part of the, the, the delegation that helped negotiate the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and, and like Jerry, I, I recommend people look at, look at Geneva and I'd say you could look at Rome too. Um, uh, one of my students uh, got an internship in the, the US embassy to Italy and subsequently went to the U.S. Embassy to the Vatican, where he was able to work on a range of issues. And in 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 in, uh, uh, in New York, there are lots of of church agencies at the U.N. is particularly the Church Center for the U.N., which houses a lot of the agencies, religious groups represented at the U.N., will be looking for for uh, interns, and they can get you involved in projects there as well. So there are lots of opportunities. I think uh, uh, they, they're a little less obvious, but with some persistence like Shannon showed, uh, I think you can you can uncover them and get embed yourself and get some real good training. I would, yeah, I would agree. And I would just add that uh, oftentimes if you are studying abroad, uh, which many students do as a part of their education, you can have those fantastic opportunities that Drew mentioned. Uh, and uh, we had several of our students at Catholic U who worked for the uh, the dicastery in, in, uh, at the Holy See in Rome through their study abroad in Rome or worked for the uh, U.S. Embassy abroad or the, the Vatican Embassy, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, representation to the Holy See. So those are sometimes not off the, a little off the beaten track of what you'd think of for the, uh, the path. I think um, Annie put in the chat about the Holy See uh, internship. So that is more infor information there, but also some of the religious orders also have uh, Office of Justice and Peace. Uh, they also do lobbying and advocacy, both at the United Nations uh, in New York and in Geneva. Uh, uh, many of them are located in Rome. Uh, so those are some wonderful opportunities as well. Thank you. And I, and I've, I've Go got ahead. one more. We, we, we are about to get funding for uh, this Catholic Peace Fooling Network uh, is about to get funding for a postgraduate fellowship uh, with the Holy See working on peace and justice issues. That'll start, uh, we hope, in, in August. And one other, I'll speak for Drew's uh, former uh, gig at America Magazine, uh, but often uh, with Catholic publications and media, they often have opportunities as well. Erin? I just had a quick note for, um, I think all of us on the panel have like, done the UN, NATO, um, government job application. And I think just a quick tip to get past the machines and into a real human is when you see the, um, the description, make sure you use their keywords in your resume um, and in your cover letter. So if they say you need a very specific skill, like make sure you write that skill that you like did it in one of your jobs in your resume, because if you don't have the keywords, you won't ever get to a human. 
Aaron's point is really key and I'm forgetting there's a there's a service you can apply to that will rate your cover letters. I'm just blanking out on the name right now. It's something like Blue Sky. Uh, if you Google it, you'll come up. There's different ones and it will it will check you on whether you have uh, reached enough of the key words uh, in your cover letter and in your application to make it past the AI. Thanks. What is the world coming to? And it's really, really important, as Aaron said, for those government jobs and those UN jobs because they get yeah. too many applications that they do that. In addition to the information, Jerry, uh, do you have an inspirational moment or two of comment for our, our wonderful group that's gathered this week? Well, the... Uh, you know, a common, common question has come up this week about whether this goal of eliminating nuclear weapons is realistic or not, uh, whether it's or whether it's just a pipe dream and utopian. Uh, and, you know, when I, I, some of us here grew up in the Cold War and we were told that like the poor, the Cold War would always be with us. It was the defining defining characteristic of the international system was a Cold War since since the end of World War II. So if in two years after I started working at the Catholic Bishops Conference in March of 1989, if I would have given a talk in Washington, and if I would have said that by the end of 1989, in nine months, the Soviet bloc would be no more. And if by the end of 1991, <laughs> the Soviet Union would be no more. And of course the Cold War would be no more. I would have been fired for being delusional, <laughs> and, but that's what happened. So that's what gives me hope that this utopian ideal or supposedly utopian dream of a world without nuclear weapons just might not be as impossible as it might seem right now. And certainly it gives me hope that we can do a much better job than we're doing now in terms of, in the, the, in terms of uh, moving beyond the what I think is an immoral and unjust uh, nuclear status quo. Thank you. Drew. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jerry. That's a, that's a good thought to take with us. I really had two practical suggestions. One was that in addition to uh, joining in our student conversations that uh, the participants could, could continue um, uh, uh, their involvement, but just keeping keeping their eye on the nuclear calendar, watching to see what what happens with the entrance into force of the of the non of the uh, of the uh, treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons on on the twenty second. Um, a good place to do that is reaching Critical Will, which is a publication of the Women's League for Peace and Freedom, one of the World War One era organizations that still does tremendous work. And uh, I know in my own work. I found that reaching critical will a really go-to source for getting my thinking going on lots of things, and I'd recommend that to you strongly. But the the other events, this notable events this spring, will be the the deadline for a new start on on February fifth, uh, and then in August the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review. Uh, in between, you might want to look and see about what's happening on on the JCPOA, the, the Iran nuclear deal, and. Uh, one way to do that is to look at the nuclear calendar, which is a publication of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, uh, which will, put, will, will deal with current issues, but also with, with uh, upcoming conferences and events and so on. And so you could keep, keep alert on things. The second issue I wanted to talk about was, was uh, uh, religious engagement. People want to explore moral issues. Uh, um, despite the, the cynicism that's prevalent in lots of places, lots of people want to talk, even the cynics frequently want to talk about it. It's just that they, they, they have not been able to spend more than five minutes talking about it. When they can talk 15, 20 minutes, they get serious. And we found in, in work we've done with the Bishop's Conference in my day that they really wanted to talk about these issues. Uh, the impediment was that clergy are afraid of them. Clergy are afraid that if you talk about serious moral issues, you divide the community. So uh, clergy of all denominations, including uh, Jewish rabbis, uh, who think it'd be quite forward, uh, are afraid of it. And so one way to get around that is, is to just coax your, your pastor or your curate into 
into having discussions and allowing a layman to run the discussions. There are lots of respected lay people. You know who the, who the, the pastor respects? Ask that person to, to lead the discussion and begin discussions on nukes in your, in your parish. If there's, a, if there's a justice and peace committee, as Hero has in his, his parish, join that. Most parishes should have uh, parish councils and, and pastoral councils. The pastoral council at least should be dealing with these issues. And probably in many good-sized parishes, the Justice and Peace Commission. Join the Justice and Peace Commission and get these issues on the agenda. Um, uh, I think uh, another thing that's important, of course, is, is prayer. And uh, uh, I belong to a, a group that's rather elderly now called the, the, the Catholic Family Movement. But when trying to search out a couple of years ago what these, most of them are now uh, octogenarians and late septenarians, but they, they decided their contribution is going to be writing petitions on gun control that they would send to all the parishes, Protestant and Catholic, in the District of Columbia, where where gun gun killings was, you know, the slangs are very high. And they continue very successfully doing that. So I think the prayer entrance is another one. And then, of course, you can always do something like join Pac Christi. Um, the seminar has been a great encouragement to us all. I hope this week will prove a beginning of your involvement, all of you, uh, in disarmament affairs. And many of you will look back years from now and say, it was the year of the pandemic. But that seminar on nuclear disarmament gave focus to my interest, elicited my commitment, and set me on my career. Mary Ann. Yes, first of all, I want to just thank everybody for being here and, and not letting the pandemic get in the way of your education and your development. So that's a, a huge, a huge uh, thank you to all of you for coming. We've heard this week a whole lot about the urgency of various uh, nuclear weapons risks and, and the, the risk, the urgency of the new challenges that they pose. Mm -hmm. But perhaps some of the greatest risks are the risks to our own creativity, to our own imaginations to our spirits, our souls, and our sense of agency. Nuclear weapons can make us feel impotent. They can make us feel helpless and hopeless and without any agency. And there's a very false narrative, as Jerry said, that nothing can be done about nuclear weapons uh, and that, that they will always be with us and the dangers that they pose will always be with us. That is a false narrative. And I really hope this seminar has helped you to reimagine and reclaim your agency, that sense of agency. Uh, and to challenge that kind of world weary cynicism that falsely canonizes an impotence uh, and a politics of despair that's really profoundly at odds with our Christian sense of hope. So uh, the Pope is calling us to reimagine uh, a world without nuclear weapons. The church is moving in this direction. Many other partners are as well. And there's really practical reasons to, uh, to consider that, uh, that movement. Uh, history and our faith and reason have shown that deeper disarmament and peace is possible, it is practical, and it is our calling. So I'm very hopeful that uh, this week has maybe opened the aperture uh, and opened the, uh, uh, the windows to a greater sense of hope, despite the, 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 the time of the pandemic, which can be a dampener of our hopes. I, I certainly, myself, I found myself a great sense of encouragement from this time spent together. Wow, thank you, Marianne and Drew and Jerry. Uh, I, I don't know if I have a lot to go beyond what our good colleagues have said, other than a couple of perspectives. Uh, One is, I thought even in the constraints of this kind of, uh, time we find ourselves in, especially in the discussion groups, I, I think there was a sense of camaraderie. Maybe I go too far and say of community, but your numbers didn't drop off. Uh, our, our wonderful friends and colleagues from South Korea and, uh, and Japan would stay as long as they came, they could until they had to run off to class, morning class, uh, for those of us who are on United States Eastern time. Um, our good colleagues from Africa uh, staying up until the dead of night. Uh, I don't know. I hope you can turn your, your body clocks around after four days of doing this with us. But I think that 
marching forward, building on all the good things that Jerry, Drew, and Marianne said, it's important to know you're not alone. Uh, it's important to know that we we span, you know, people just out of teenagehood all the way through uh, people in their 70s. And, and we gathered together for four nights uh, to try to tackle the one of the fundamental moral issues of our time. And it, it is the Pentagon now shaking in its knees because this group has got the agenda and ready to go forward? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, Peter, Peter says yes, he's convinced. Uh, but it may be less about the Pentagon and more about all of us and especially uh, many of you going forward. Maybe you don't have a career in nuclear matters, but I'm sure by groping with these issues and and trying to puzzle about them and think about them from a, a, an ethical and religious point of view, whatever you do in your future will be deeper and richer for struggling with some of the big questions like this. But probably a number of you will, in fact, go on, because a couple of years ago, there was uh, Aaron and Sharon and our guests of today. So we hope to see you in many of the things that we have planned this year. Um, now you're, you're on our mailing list in a way as if you stepped in a wad of bubble gum. You're not going to get rid of us very easily. So uh, we welcome that and, and we welcome uh, whatever participation you can do. And also all of us on the <laughs> here and, and a certain family as well. You, you, you've got a puzzle, you've got a question, you've got an issue, shoot us an email and we'll be happy to respond. Uh, this has been a really marvelous thing. And I, I'm delighted as well to have been been part of this. I'm going to just close with a couple of logistical issues. One is, for your great citizenship and learning and discussion and sharing this week, by, I hope, uh, a week from tomorrow, we will send you a fancy certificate that you can print and hang on your wall or do whatever you'd like with that says you participated in this particular kind of activity and list it on your resume or various other things. It's something that is a couple of steps in the direction of learning about the church's position, about some weapon systems that some other people maybe haven't done, but it's something that you should get credit for, at least in, in, in our minds of the group that put this together. We'll also at about the same time, send you out the, the learning resources, the complete sort of set of packets and things, and give you the links to these presentations even that we did all this week. Uh, you're not going to get the tapes of the discussions, but we will we will give you access to the, the plenary sessions. And uh, I, I think we'll also be able to say to our sponsors like NTI and others, this kind of thing is worth an investment because look what these people, where they came from, what they did, and the kinds of contributions they made. Let me say that uh, George uh, is, was supposed to, is supposed to be retired, but he's sort of the overall architect of this program, uh, as you can tell. And so we really uh, appreciate, George, all the time you've put into this. Um, and Annie has put in uh, way more time than you've seen. You've seen all the many, many things she's done during this week, but uh, you all got here because she put a ton of time and energy into getting you here and, and preparing. One final thing, the Catholic Peace Building Network um, works on a, a wide range of issues. It's about two dozen institutions are involved in the network. So you might look at the web page and maybe you can find an institution or some other, some issue, maybe perhaps other than nuclear weapons that you're interested in um, that, that, that we're working on. So uh, that's another, another thing to pay attention to. But um, it's wonderful to have all of you here uh, thank you for being here. George, final word. Final word is go in peace. Make a difference. Get in good trouble. <laughs> <laughs>